We've talked briefly about changes of state, particularly emphasizing that they are a question of the amount of energy the molecules have, not a change in the intermolecular forces. In this video, we are going to dive a bit deeper into these changes of state. But first, a brief bit of terminology. There are four states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Uh, we're not going to deal with plasma in this class, however. But a given system could have multiple regions of different materials that are in the same state. Oil and water are both liquids, but they don't mix. Sand grains and salt crystals are both solids, but they don't mix. Gases, well, gases always mix. Regardless, each homogeneous region in a system is known as a phase. So oil and water are in the same state, but they are two different phases. Salt and sand are two phases in the same state. But in the context of transitions between states or between phases, we tend to use the two terms interchangeably. A change of state can also be called a phase transition or a phase change. With that out of the way, let's take a closer look at one particular phase change, melting, and its reverse, freezing. These two processes happen at the same temperature, known as both the melting point and the freezing point. For water, at one atmosphere pressure, that temperature is zero degrees C. For molecules with lower intermolecular attractions, that temperature is lower, as low as negative 268.9 degrees C for helium, only four and a quarter degrees above absolute zero. For molecules with higher intermolecular attractions, that temperature is higher, as high as 801 degrees C for common table salt, or a staggering 3,414 degrees C for tungsten although you'll have to wait for the upcoming Properties of Solids video to understand what is going on in that case. And we can understand these different melting points based on the intermolecular forces involved. Now let's take a closer look at the vaporization and condensation processes. But to do that, we first need to explore a bit more about the vapor, or gas, phase as it relates to other states of matter. Let's think about two molecules in the gas phase that start a long distance apart. At that long distance, they don't feel any real attraction or repulsion for each other. But as the molecules approach each other, they start to feel attractions due to the intermolecular forces between them. This means that the potential energy of the system goes down. Bring the molecules in close enough, and the molecules will start to repel each other, because they are basically sitting on top of each other. That means that the potential energy starts to go up. As long as the molecules are in the gas phase, they have enough energy to bounce back out of this potential well, that is, in between the attractions and repulsions. And so the molecules just bounce off each other, but stay unattached. But now imagine lowering the temperature, which means that the molecules have less kinetic energy. Now the molecules are stuck in the potential well. They don't have enough kinetic energy to escape the attractions of other molecules. This is what is happening when gases condense into liquids. The molecules are stuck together because they don't have enough kinetic energy to escape the attractions. But we also know that in a real sample, not every molecule has exactly the same amount of kinetic energy. Some have more, some have less. We have a very good understanding of this phenomenon as shown here. As the temperature goes up, the fraction of molecules that have higher speeds, and thus kinetic energies, goes up. So now let's imagine that there is some threshold energy that is required to escape the attractions of neighboring molecules. Notice that even the lowest temperatures, there is a small fraction of molecules that have enough energy to escape their neighbors. This means that there will be some small fraction of the molecules that will be in the gas phase, even if the majority of the sample is liquid or even a solid. A concrete example of this phenomenon is humidity. Water boils at 100 degrees C, but at any temperature below that, there will still be some water vapor in the air. How much? An amount measured as a partial pressure that depends on the temperature. This is known as the vapor pressure of the substance. If we look at this vapor pressure for water over the temperature range where water is a liquid, we see that the vapor pressure, as we would expect, increases as we increase the temperature. More molecules have sufficient energy to escape into the gas phase. Let's look at something else on this plot. Water, at one atmosphere pressure, boils at 100 degrees C. 
What is one atmosphere pressure in the units on this graph kilopascals? 101.325 kilopascals. The fact that the vapor pressure of water is exactly one atmosphere at its boiling point is no accident. Let's see why. Let's imagine a bubble spontaneously forming in water, because some neighboring molecules all got enough kinetic energy through their collisions with their neighbors to escape into the vapor phase. This bubble is filled only with water vapor, so we know the pressure inside the bubble. It's the vapor pressure of water at whatever temperature the water is, let's say 50 degrees C. But we also know the outside pressure of the atmosphere. This means that the external pressure is over eight times the bubble's internal pressure, and so the bubble very simply collapses before it can even get started. We still have water vapor evaporating from the surface of the water, but bubbles don't form, and so the water isn't boiling. Now let's raise the temperature. Now the bubble that forms has the same internal pressure as the outside atmosphere. No net pressure difference means no net force on the surface of the bubble. The bubble is therefore stable and can float to the surface due to the lower density of the bubble and then burst. This, very simply, is boiling. The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is sufficient to support bubbles against the outside atmospheric pressure. A question you should ask yourself at this point is how the boiling point of water should vary with altitude. Pause the video to consider that question. A complete answer will not only include what the dependence is, but also an explanation of how you arrived at that conclusion. And here's the answer. Pause the video to look through the analysis if it isn't clear to you. So finally, let's return to our set of phase transitions. We now understand the states of matter as resulting from the amount of kinetic energy in the sample, which we measure by temperature, relative to the amount of energy required for molecules to be able to tumble past one another as in a liquid, or escape one another entirely as in a gas. We also understand that vaporization always happens from liquids because some small fraction of the liquids have enough kinetic energy to escape the liquid phase. And we understand that boiling is the special case of vaporization that happens when the vapor pressure of the liquid matches the surrounding atmospheric pressure. To complete the picture, let's look very briefly at sublimation, which is the direct transition from solid to gas. Just as there is a vapor pressure over a liquid, there's a vapor pressure, often rather small, over a solid which happens naturally by sublimation. There are some substances, such as carbon dioxide, that under standard conditions will directly sublime. This is so-called dry ice, which sublimes directly to gaseous carbon dioxide at negative 78.5 degrees C, and is called dry because it doesn't proceed through a liquid state. Finally, freezing, condensation, and deposition are simply the reverse processes of melting, vaporization, and sublimation.